time for us to get started this morning. As you can see, we're going to be in the book of Galatians. So if you want to open up your Bibles there, we'll cover a little ground today, do some introductory stuff. It's been a while since I have taught the auditorium class. I've been teaching in uh, Hebrews Way in different classrooms and uh, enjoying the fellowship there. The beauty of the auditorium is that I say what I want to say and you just have to take it, you know. Um, but it also means that uh, sometimes I don't get the feedback like I get in the other classes. Sometimes the pushback, that's a lot of fun. But anyway, I'm glad to be in here with you um, and slightly surprised by all the, the Christmas um, decoration. You know, I, I grew up in a church where it was debatable whether or not you're supposed to celebrate Christmas. And we certainly weren't going to be putting Christmas decorations up. Um, this thing's changed, man. Things change a lot, don't they? Over, over 30, 40 years, they'll change. Um, so, and I don't think we did Christmas decorations when I first, we first came to North Boulevard, 2005. But who, I can't remember, honestly. Um, but I think they look great. And I got my eyes on one of these poinsettias. So, um, well... Uh, let's start off with a prayer, and we're going to launch into the book of Galatians, um, and mostly do introductory material today. So let's pray together. Father, we come to you now, and we praise you for being our creator and our sustainer. You are the giver of all good gifts. Lord, we pray your blessing on us as we consider things of an eternal nature, as we look into your word. Through your spirit, Father, guide us so that... Uh, we can understand what we read, but more importantly, that we can put it into practice and be more like your son, Jesus. We pray this in his name. Amen. Um, we're going to be looking a lot at maps today because it's an introductory kind of thing. I love to teach from maps. That does remind me what's round on the ends and high in the middle. What's round on the ends and high in the middle. Ohio. Yeah. Yeah. Is that an old Ohio joke, Bob? <laughs> um, so, and speaking of uh, football, I don't know why, how that mentions football, but uh, I noticed that they're supposed to be announcing the college football playoff teams, the four teams, at 11.15 today, which is right smack dab in the middle of church. So, got any Alabama fans out there, you have to wait. You have to wait. You can't look. Yeah, no celebrating in the middle of a sermon, okay, um, whether or not your team made it. Okay, so what I want to do is do the, you know, the newspaper stuff about the book of Galatians. The who, what, when, where, why. Try to understand uh, the, the major theme of the book of Galatians. And get us ready so that we can launch and just go through the text throughout this quarter. So the first question, who, meaning who is the author, and clearly it's Paul, says so in Galatians chapter 1, uh, verses 1 and 2. Paul, an apostle, sent not from men nor by a man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers and sisters with me to the churches in Galatia. So the author is clearly Paul, and he immediately begins by introducing himself, but he also has to throw in a little bit of uh, justification. And you'll see this come through in the book of Galatians. He's having to justify himself in his claims. He says he's sent not from men nor by a man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father. So he's immediately kind of defensive, if you will. He's saying that his apostleship was not of his own making. Therefore, no human being has any right to question it. You'll see the nature of this defensive language as we move along. To whom is the letter written? Well, that's clear on the one hand, and on the other hand, it's not at all. So let's spend a little bit of time talking about something. If you read in the commentaries, you're going to come across the question about who are the Galatians. So, there are two major theories that Bible scholars debate. The North Galatian and the South Galatian theory. Now, here's the thing. You have two choices. You have to pick one, and your eternal soul 
depends on picking the right one. So get it right, okay? You know I'm kidding. Um, but it does matter. It doesn't matter in some big theological context for your faith, but it matters some on how we understand uh, how the Bible fits together, okay? So uh, I do want to try to explain to you why I'm going to spend a little time talking about it, but at the same time, it's okay if you disagree with me. I'm okay with you being wrong, but I want to make my case. First of all, just lay out the, what's uh, going on and then make my case. So like I said, we're going to look at a lot of maps. I'll give you a second to digest this map. You see a lot of maps like this in church because it's dealing with um, the... Uh, well, Palestine here south of Syria, moving up into Asia Minor, into modern day Turkey, where a lot of the New Testament takes place, right? All the way down to Jerusalem down here. Okay, so notice Galatia written right here on this map. And we got two circles. One indicates um, the area that would be included if we go with the North Galatian theory. That's this one. And the South Galatian theory is a bigger circle or a bigger oval here that includes places like Iconium, Lystra, and Derby. So the question is, is Paul writing to the Galatians here or the Galatians here? Now, that might seem odd to even want to question why that might be. But let me um, explain part of what's going on. So historically... Long before the time of Paul, there was a kingdom of Galatia right here. And its capital was, um, well, modern-day Ankara. The, the ancient name is very similar, uh, similar to that. So there's the kingdom of Galatia. And then later on when the Romans come around, sometime in the, I want to say just before the time of Jesus, but maybe just after in the first century, they have a formal province that they call Galatia that includes cities like Lystra, Derby, and Iconium. However, historically, those cities aren't included in that map, okay, aren't included as part of Galatia. So you've got kind of tribal Galatia, where the Galatian tribes are, and then you've got the province of Galatia, as the Romans called them, okay? So if you recognize Lystra, Iconium, Derby, that might ring bells because you, you see these cities in the book of Acts and Antioch. There are several Antiochs in the ancient world. This one is not the one in Syria. There's that one. But instead, Antioch, um, this is called Pisidian Antioch. So it would be, these cities are part of Galatia, the province, but not historical or tribal Galatia. So the real question is, would you call these people down here Galatians? You got an argument for it, and you got an argument against it we got to figure out what Paul is doing. So let's see. You might not be able to make out a whole lot on this, but I want you to see that um, this is the insert. So the, the big map here to give you an idea of where you are in relation to Europe and Asia. And then zooming in right here. And then this is a timeline of Paul's life. Okay, and notice if we go with a Southern Galatian theory, then the letter's written a little earlier, 48, 49, or maybe 52 A.D., Whereas if we go with the North Galatian theory, it's going to be a little later in Paul's ministry. Not, not fundamentally later. We're talking just a matter of a few years. It's not a, a huge issue. And by the way, this isn't a conservative or liberal issue. So um, scholars come down uh, all over the place on this stuff. So zooming in on this map, another one showing you North Galatia and South Galatia. Again, we're talking about the province of Galatia. This, this hard designation between north and south is probably not that helpful. But uh, again, you'll see here, here's Ankara, the capital of Galatia, uh, tribal Galatia, if you will. So in the first century, would Paul have called people in the province of Galatia, but who weren't Galatians historically, would he have called them Galatians? It's a, it's a really interesting question, and our, one of our biggest helps here is going to be the book of Acts, okay? So when we figure out a timeline of Paul's life, we use his letters, and we use the book of Acts, and we try to fit them all together. And the real question is, is Galatians the first letter Paul wrote, or does it come later down the list with 1 Thessalonians being first? And it all is a question about where in the book of Acts does Galatians fit? So we'll talk more about that in just a second. 
So if I said that I'm from the southeastern United States, what would I mean by that, that I'm from the southeastern United States? I'm originally from Moulton, Alabama, North Alabama. Does that qualify? Southeastern? Okay. So, have you seen this map before? You know what this is a map of? That's the Southeastern Conference. Okay? So, a thousand years from now, somebody's going through our rubble and, and things, and they see that someone says they're from the Southeastern United States, and then they see that there's a Southeastern Conference. Can they readily assume that someone from northern Missouri is from the southeast? Okay, so you start to see the dilemma here. Just because we have uh, a formal name for something doesn't mean we would call someone from uh, Missouri. In fact, here's a map of where they are geographically. And according to this map, anyway, and check me on this if you uh, want to, um, the... Uh, campus of the University of Missouri is actually north of Indianapolis. So to give you an idea how far, so that's not exactly southern, and starting next year, Oklahoma and the University of Texas are in the SEC. That's not exactly eastern anymore, right? Now, I don't care about the, who's in the Southeastern Conference, who's not. Kentucky has been for a very long time. I don't know that it fits as southeastern, does it? I don't know. Arkansas used to not be in the conference. Now it is and that kind of stuff. So anyway, point being, we might debate over whether or not these places are really southeastern. So are the cities of Lystra and Derby and uh, Iconium and Antioch, are they, are they Galatian? Or are they not Galatian? So here's the, a blown up version of that timeline I used a moment ago. Um, and uh, uh, a little easier to see. So I'm going to argue that Paul wrote Galatians. It wasn't the first letter that we have in the New Testament that he wrote. I'm going to go with the North Galatian view, and I want to lay out why I think that is. So, again, you, you've really got to choose one or the other. And when we say that the South Galatian theory is a is an earlier date. We're just talking with a, um, a handful of years. It's not a, a huge difference, but they're definitely earlier. So if he's writing to the South Galatians, that'd be the people in Lystra and Derbe and Iconium and Antioch. There are Greek believers in the Roman province of Galatia, political Galatia, if you will. Those are cities that Paul established churches in in Acts 13 and 14. So all those places are mentioned in Acts 13 and 14. But if you go with the North Galatian theory, then we're talking about the Gallic believers or the Gallic believers in the territory of Galatia. They're, they're the ethnic Galatians or tribal Galatians, including the series of um, Ankara, uh, Pessinus, and Tavium. And it's in his second missionary journey that he actually goes to that Galatia. It's worth noting that the word Galatia only appears once in Acts and it's Acts 16.6. Nowhere does Acts refer to these cities as Galatia, okay? So that little bit of evidence might point towards the fact that Paul wouldn't have considered those Galatia, all right? Therefore, he's writing to the Galatians in tribal Galatia. This argument is baked into so many things that... Uh, you'll come across, but you can easily miss it. So you might uh, be just for your own personal edification, or maybe you're going to teach a class, and you want to look up and say, hey, when did Paul write his letters? How do, I, how do I match that up? And so you find a graphic like this, and it'll show Paul's letters in chronological and geographical order, and it's really neat to see where the letters go, and it's very helpful, something like this. This is exactly the kind of thing I use in my class. And then it shows in chronological order. And what you can miss is somebody has decided that the South Galatian theory is right. How do I know that? Because they put Galatians first in Paul's letters. Because they're saying it coincides with Acts 13 and 14. But I'm going to argue that the North Galatian theory is right. And so according to me, Galatians should be further down this list. So again, you just come across a graphic like this. You don't, think, you don't realize somebody's already made a decision for you. But they have. Or this is from the Holman Bible Dictionary. 
You might come across, uh, uh, you know, events in Paul's life, and you'll see that he writes Galatians after 1 Thessalonians. So we're getting here now in the more the middle part of the 50s versus 1 Thessalonians, probably the late 40s that he's writing that. Okay, so why do I think that the North Galatian theory fits the best? It's because of the events that are described in Acts chapter 15 compared with what's described in Galatians chapter 2. So I just want to quickly show you there. We're not going to refer to Acts a lot as we go along, but we will today. So in Acts 15, you have this important uh, meeting uh, of the uh, often called the Jerusalem Council. And um, it is a meeting of the apostles, the elders of the church in Jerusalem, to decide how are uh, Gentiles going to be incorporated to the uh, Messiah believers? And side note, that is the question of Galatians. All right? It's how do Jewish uh, Christians and Gentile Christians get along? More specifically, how do Gentile believers enter into the family of God? This is the pressing question of the New Testament. It is the thing, that the big issue that's discussed in more of the New Testament than really any other issue. It's what the early Christians dealt with in the New Testament more than any other controversy. How do Jews and Gentiles get along? And so, all the Galatians about it. Romans is about it. A lot of 1 Corinthians is about it. Acts is about it. You get some taste of it in the Gospels as well. I mean, it's all over the place. And Galatians is smack dab in the middle of the argument. So what's going on? Well, Acts 15, 1. Certain people came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the believers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. This brought Paul and Barnabas into a sharp dispute and debate with them. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed, along with some other believers, to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question. So you see the setup here. You've got some Christians saying, we will allow Gentiles to be part of the family, but they need to be circumcised first. And you've got others, like Paul and Barnabas, sharply disputing with them, and they're at loggerheads. So what are we going to do? We need to go to the, we, the mother church, if you will, to the Jerusalem church where the apostles are, where the elders of the church of Jerusalem are, and we're going to settle this. We've got to figure this out. So it says in verse 6, the apostles and elders met to consider this question in Jerusalem. After much discussion, now, oh, I, I skipped verse 5, and, and notice this. This kind of should stand out to us. Then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said the Gentiles must be circumcised and required to keep the law of Moses. All right, so let's break this down for a second. Some of the believers, believers in Jesus, these are Messiah believers. We call them Christians. The Bible doesn't use the word Christian very often. Um, you, it prefers disciples and believers. But So these are believers. They're Jewish believers in Jesus as a Messiah. So they are Christians. They're also Pharisees. Come back to that in just a second. And what they say is that for a Gentile to be accepted into the church, that Gentile needs to become a Jew. Which means uh, if they're male, they need to be circumcised, and then they need to observe the law of Moses. Specifically, they're going to have to eat kosher, got to observe the, the holidays that we observe. Um, and so they're going to convert to Judaism, if you will. Now let me say this, I want to speak up for Paul's opponents for a minute to see why their, their logic kind of works. Now obviously it's wrong, but I want you to show you what the, the logic is. For quite a while in the Roman world, there had been these Gentiles who were interested in Judaism. You know, Judaism was not an evangelistic religion. God didn't say, go out and convert all the pagans to be Israelites. He never said that. What he did say was, I'm going to bless those who bless you. I'm going to curse those who curse you. So you bless Israel, I'll bless you. You curse Israel, I'll curse you. Um, and so Israel could be a blessing, but it wasn't evangelistic in that way. And yet, you know, sometime in the you know, early centuries uh, before the time of Christ, you start to see people who are, 
who are um, from pagan backgrounds, and, and maybe it's because of the messed up theology of the pagan gods, and maybe it's because they see all the, the um, trouble that comes from their traditional religions, they, that start to take an interest in the God of the Jews and the religion of the Jews. And so you have this interesting thing where, where you've got all these non-Jews who, who want to go to synagogues and they want to learn about the God of Moses. So what do you do? The Old Testament doesn't really tell you what to do about that. There are a few converts to Judaism in the Old Testament, but there's not really a, a method for doing it. So they have to develop a system by which a person could convert to Judaism. Obviously, if you're male, one of the first things that means is you're going to have to be circumcised. And unfortunately, circumcision comes up a lot in this letter, so just go ahead and get comfortable with it, okay? It's going to, it's going to be a, a, a topic on several occasions. So, there were uh, Jews who absolutely hated Gentiles. But there were Jews who at least could accept Gentiles as Jews if they converted. So they, they weren't absolutely anti-Gentile. They just wanted the Gentiles to become Jews first. They had a system for doing that. Uh, that's even talked about in the New Testament. So you remember when Jesus said in Matthew chapter 23, Woe to you, teachers of the law. He says, you travel land and sea to win a single convert. But when you do, you make him twice as much a son of hell as you are. So by the first century, there are evangelistic Jews who are converting people to Judaism. And so they have a method for bringing Gentiles into the family. And what it does is it respects the law. It respects your tradition. It respects the God that you serve. Yes, God has a plan to, for all Gentiles to be saved, and that is for them to become Jews. Okay? If you follow that logic, then you see God sent his Messiah, and as a Jew, you accept that Messiah. He's promised him for centuries. Now the Messiah has come. Great. He can save the Gentiles as well. They just need to become Jews. Right? We've got a system for this. The problem is, Paul says, the problem is, if it's becoming a Jew that saves you, if it's the law that saves you, you don't need the Jesus part, right? And that's the last thing he's ever going to say. It's Jesus or nothing, okay? So, on the one hand, these believers, these Pharisees, which by the way, they didn't stop being Pharisees when they became followers of Jesus. Neither did Paul. Don't believe me? Look in the book of Acts. Way on later in the book of Acts, Paul will say of himself, I am a Pharisee. And that's because Paul did not convert to Christianity. These people didn't convert to Christianity. These people were Jews who accepted Jesus as the Messiah. That did not make them any less Jewish. The concept of Christianity, is, again, is foreign to the New Testament. The whole idea is that through Jesus we are all saved, the Messiah of Israel. The word Christ means Messiah, right? We're, and so Paul didn't convert to uh, Christianity. He accepted Jesus as his Messiah, and that changed the way he viewed his faith. He was still a Jew. He still called himself a Jew. For the first several years that the Christian faith was in the world, every single believer in Jesus was Jewish. Years. It's not um, until you get to Acts chapter 10 that you have the first Gentile believer in Jesus. So, the New Testament assumes there are a lot of Jewish believers in Jesus that they continue to be Jews. The question is, what does that mean for Gentiles who believe in Jesus? So I can kind of sympathize with the fact that, you know, to respect your tradition and your people, you believe in this God who sent this Messiah, it makes sense that these Gentiles need to become like you. I mean, why are you bothering facing the persecution? Why are you bothering uh, raising your children to be different than their neighbors if they don't have to do that stuff to be saved anyway, right? Right? 
Why, why do you have to keep all this law and all of a sudden these Gentiles don't? You kind of see why it, it seems like an insult in some way. But they're missing the importance of Jesus in the middle of this. So what happens in Acts 15 is you've got, they have this meeting. Notice it's Barnabas and Paul. They go to Jerusalem and they meet with the apostles. And so they meet with uh, Peter and they meet with James. James comes up in Acts and he comes up in um, Galatians. So notice Paul and Barnabas, Jerusalem, Peter, James, uh, Simon, which is another name for Peter. So notice, notice this Jerusalem, Paul and Barnabas, James, Peter, okay? And then in Galatians chapter 2, he says, After 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem, this time with Barnabas. I took Titus along also. I went in response to Revelation and meeting privately with those esteemed as leaders, I presented them the gospel that I preach among the Gentiles. Okay, so he's talking about when he went to Jerusalem, he took Barnabas with him, and he talked about his gospel, the gospel that didn't include the law of Moses. Now, we're going we're gonna to go through Galatians 2 later, but I want you to notice who he talks about. He, he mentions these pillars, these people who were esteemed as leaders in the Jerusalem church. Who are they? Well, Peter, he says. James, Cephas, another name for Peter. So James, Cephas, Barnabas, Paul, Jerusalem, question of circumcision. Okay, you kind of see? There, there's a lot of similarity between Acts 15 and Galatians chapter 2. Do you believe they're describing the same event? If you do, you're a North Galatian person. If you say, no, this doesn't line up exactly, because there certainly are details that are left out by both if, they're, if they did describe this, that, then you probably are a South Galatian person. And you'd say, no, this took place back in Acts 13 and 14. We just don't have record of it in Acts 13 and 14. Maybe. But that would mean you, they hadn't really solved the issue again for quite a bit of time, for a few years at least. So the Jerusalem Council... Um, even though he had this meeting with them and everything in Acts 13, it's not until Acts 15 that we actually get um, um, the Jerusalem Council. So, you know, in my mind, the timeline doesn't work out as well if you go with the South Galatian theory. I can tell by the look in your eyes, you've heard enough about North Galatian and South Galatian theory. So, let's move on. We're just going to know that the North Galatian theory is right, Okay. North Galatians is right, South Galatians is wrong. You're a heretic if you believe it. Um, okay, so when was it written? Well, if it's North Galatian, then it's, like I said, mid-50s. If it's uh, South Galatian, then late 40s or early 50s. It really matters how you insert Galatians in the book of Acts and where you put it in the list of uh, where, where it lies in Paul's chronology. Okay, those are the big things at stake. For interpreting the letter, not huge. I'll admit that. It's not going to make a big difference on how we, what the letter says. So why was the letter written? Well, there were those in the Galatian churches who would only accept Gentiles in the fellowship if they converted to Judaism first. They questioned Paul and his message. Paul wrote to dispute with them and to accurately portray the gospel of Jesus and its power to save all humanity, all humanity apart from the law of Moses. So what you don't get from Paul is like you get in Philippians where he just has this warm message, oh, how I love you and I love to be with you and I think about you all the time and that kind of stuff. No. He's, he starts off, Paul, an apostle, not sent by any man, sent by God himself, right? So he's defensive. He's telling the Galatians. Now he loves them, but he also has to start off knowing that he's on a different ground than he is in, in other letters where he has to defend himself here. I would argue that the key verse of the book of Galatians, you could pick a lot, is Galatians 5.1. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Specifically, freedom from the law. So there's a, a very practical point, and then there's a theological point. The practical point is this. In the first century, did Gentiles have to become Jews to follow Jesus? Paul says no. The Bible says no. You believe in Jesus, you give your life to Jesus, you're baptized into Christ, you are a follower of Christ. You don't need the law of Moses. Okay, that's a practical point. But then there's a, a bigger theological one, which is how much of my own performance factors into my salvation? In what sense do I do things to be saved? 
How much is my flesh, how much of my flesh am I relying on? So we're going to get into those, those deep questions and, and try to hopefully do some thought, uh, thought-provoking, some faith-provoking things. Here's a shot of Galatians chapters 1 and 2 from a Bible. And I have there, every time I saw it, I probably missed one or two. Um, uh, in red, every time Paul references himself. So he says, I or me. So it's Paul and then every instance of I or me. Not even the ones that talk about my or mine, just I or me. Look how, uh, how much he references himself here. That's not normal for Paul. He's having to defend himself. He's having to explain to these people why it is that he could have the nerve to say what he's saying. To tell these Jewish Christians who thought they had a good system. <laughs> no, it's wrong. It's clear that the Jerusalem church, again, was a very influential in the uh, first century because that's where the apostles were. That's where James was. James, the brother of Jesus, who's not technically an apostle, but in some sense seems to have as much authority or maybe even more than an apostle. He's a big deal. And that Jerusalem church, well, it wouldn't be a surprise that it's completely Jewish. So for them, whether or not you accept Gentiles in a certain way, not a big deal. But in the mission field, it's a huge deal. And Paul's coming up with it over and over again. So Paul says, I was called to be the apostle to the Greeks or to the Gentiles. He says to the uncircumcised. Peter was the apostle for the circumcised, he said, for the Jews. Okay, so this Paul's mission and the relationship of law of Moses go hand in hand. He, he's got to solve this for his mission work. Okay. So let's jump in and do the first four, five verses of Galatians 1, and then we'll be done for today. So we've already read the first two verses. So he says to the churches in Galatia, Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age, according to the will of God and Father, of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. So this begins like many of Paul's letters. He introduces himself. Again, he's defensive in the way that he discusses, uh, immediately has to describe who sent him. But then we get the, oftentimes it's not just Paul, it's Paul and someone else. Here he just says, and the brothers. Oftentimes it's Paul and Timothy, or once it's Paul and Sosthenes. You know, Paul and someone else will write the letter, but it's clear usually that's Paul himself who's doing the writing. This is a familiar um, formulation that Paul often used. He'll say, grace and peace to you from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. So I think this is true. A lot of, a lot of Bible scholars have pointed out. I think, I think there's something to say for it. So the, the word for hello or, or greeting in Greek um, is uh, very similar and ba- based on the same root as the word for grace. Okay, so charis is a ver- form of charis. So in uh, the Greek-speaking world, you're going to greet someone, you'll say greetings. And you'll see that in the book of Acts. They'll start off greetings and they walk up to someone. You know, the word hello is not that old, by the way. Did you know that the word hello as a greeting? is, is Really, since the invention of the telephone, that we use hello as a, as a greeting. Yeah, Google that. You'll see. It's been around longer than that, but to be used as a greeting versus some other exclamation is, is pretty new. Um, so, anyway, uh, greetings, you know, how are people supposed to welcome each other? Well, greetings. The, for, the word for greetings is very similar to the word for grace in uh, Greek. And the word peace, all the Jews greet each other with shalom, peace, right? In the Arabic-speaking world, it's salam. It's, so you greet someone with peace, and they extend the peace back to you. So, probably what he's doing here is kind of doing the traditional gentile greeting however with a little twist instead of it being just greeting it's focused on a uh, a similar word grace so he's saying grace maybe to the gentile brothers and he's saying peace to the jewish brothers or probably to both both to both right so that's why those often go together he says grace and peace probably because he's pulling on two traditional ways to greet each other a greek one 
and a Hebrew one and pull them together. So notice he mentions twice already, he's mentioned God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Mentioned in, um, in verse 1, sent by Jesus Christ and God the Father, and now God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. You get so much language like this from Paul. Paul doesn't come out and say Jesus is God. Now there are one or two verses where he might say that. To get that, you've got to go to, like, to the Gospel of John. It's the Gospel of John, chapter 1, where you get the most clear um, dec declaration that Jesus is God. John chapter 1, verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word uh, was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. John chapter 1, verse 14, The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. So that Word was with God, but that Word was God, and that Word became flesh. And John says, we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only, or the only begotten. So you get, you get a clear theological statement from John that Jesus is God. What you get in Paul's language is that he ties God the Father and Jesus Christ together so much that they're inseparable in many ways. He wasn't just sent by God, he was sent by Jesus. He wasn't just sent by Jesus, he was sent by God. He praises God and he praises Jesus, okay? Those are, they're clearly, he's wrapping them together that way. Now, if I had to guess, if you held me down and, and put a gun to my head, put it that way, and made me say, why does Paul do it that way? My guess is, for most Jews to come out and say it this way, to say that Jesus is God, it's a little, hmm. You remember because there's only one God and it, it, it can be a little hard to grasp it. So even though they can accept it, let's not say it that way. Say, God the Father and Jesus the Lord, that's all good. Whereas, Gentiles were much more comfortable saying, yeah, Jesus is God. And that's what you see the early church doing as it becomes more and more uh, Gentile. It'll just come out and say more forthrightly, Jesus is God. So I'm, what I, I believe Paul thought Jesus was God, but he says it in ways like this. Okay, I probably went on too long about that, sorry. So, he gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age. <clears throat> I wish we could talk about this longer, but um, there's always a danger in assuming that our current time is the most evil time. There's always a danger in acting like there's not evil all around us. Definitely, there's a danger of that, right? But I just put it this way. Don't tell anybody I said this <clears throat> outside this room, okay? In more conservative-leaning churches like ours, it's kind of absolutely essential that you believe everything's bad. Everything has to be bad. It used to be better, and it's getting worse, all right? It's kind of that, this ap apocalyptic view of, of everything. <clears throat> and there's some truth to it, right? But it, it, the problem you have is, if things were so great in my grandfather's time, why was his preacher telling him, things are horrible? Everybody's going to hell. So there's a benefit as believers for us to say, I live in an evil age. There absolutely is. We need to recognize it for what it is. And I can give you plenty of instances of evil in our community, in our country, in our world. Don't have to try real hard. I don't have to idolize the past to do that, though. Because I can also show you plenty of instances where there was an evil age. So, the Bible really pushes back against this notion of nostalgia. Paul lived in an evil age. Next week, if I remember to do it, Lord willing, I'll show you um, a quote from 1901 in the Gospel Advocate about, about <clears throat> Middle Tennessee in the year 1901 right? Which in a lot of our minds must have been idyllic. It must have been the most Christian place in the world, right? I mean, it, lots of churches of Christ around everywhere. Everybody's going to church. Everybody believes, right? It must have been great. I want you to see what one preacher said, <clears throat> if I remember to do it. <clears throat> That's a good setup, isn't it? So Paul lived in an evil age. We live in an evil age. The benefit of believing that is you believe you need Jesus, the Jews need Jesus, the Gentiles need Jesus, I need Jesus, you need Jesus. So, he gave himself for evil ages, for people who live in evil ages, for our sins and to rescue us from that evil age. 
according to the will of God our Father. And then um, uh, he has this, uh, you know, kind of almost a song of praise, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. So this is his formal greeting to the churches in Galatia to say who he is and to send a blessing to them. From here on out, it's a pretty strong argument about why he's doing the things that he's doing. The basis of his argument is this. When I was called to be an apostle, it wasn't because I was just hanging around Jerusalem and I heard this cool message and I thought, hey, I believe that. (laughs) No, far from it. I was dead set against the gospel. I was dead set against Jesus. God tapped me on the shoulder, though. He got my attention. And he gave me my gospel. I didn't get it from anybody else. I didn't have to go to Jerusalem and learn it from Peter. I didn't have to find out Um, you know, what to preach from the apostles? No. It was given me directly from God. So, if it's given directly to me by God, I have the right to say what I'm saying. I have the right to tell Jews, you have to accept Gentiles in the fellowship. Um, So, it's defensive, again, lots of references to himself. And he's going to explain, look, so let me tell you, you've heard stories about what I've done in my life, he says. So yes, first I went into Arabia. Okay, I did that. Then, Galatians chapter 2, verse 1, after 13 years, I went to Jerusalem. Okay, so he's explaining kind of the chronology of it. But even when I went to Jerusalem, you've all heard about me going there. I didn't go there to get the apostles' permission. I didn't go there to let them teach me. No. In fact, what I did was I went and I told them what I was preaching, and they said, good. We're all on the same page. So don't think anything different. So on the one hand, he's saying, the, me and the apostles, we're all simpatico. We're good. But I don't need them because I got my message from Jesus. And that's the message that I preach. It's all about Jesus and the freedom that he brings. That's what we're going to see throughout the letter to the Galatians. All right, it's time for us to finish. Thanks so much for your attention. Lord willing, we'll pick up here next week.